Here we are. Oh, here we are. Now I feel like a pop singer that I can. That, that's fine. Uh, so uh, I'll try not to go too much in depth and not too long, but the issue is crucial to understand part of the events in the Middle East. And you forgive me, I go a little bit for history, and I will tire you with few academic uh, insights, and then we'll go uh, maybe for more easiest uh, subjects. But I must give you some background in order to understand what we're all about. I uh, uh, requested to speak about the Arab media. So I'll do it as following. I give a small historical background. If somebody feels necessity to ask within my things, that will be OK, because it, uh, you simply can stop me and uh, ask a question. Try uh, to do it when I have a small question, not when the question is moving the whole subject in 180 uh, degrees. And uh, in the end, if we'll have some time, and you have patience and you don't have to run back home, uh, we'll give some time for uh, Q&A. So, uh, Saar was giving me a great opportunity to start, in fact, in Syria. The Arab media, as most places, started as printed media. In fact, the media in the Middle East started basically in the mid-19th century, in the times that I mentioned regarding to identity, about shaping Arab identity and Muslim identity, started in the decline of the Ottoman Empire, and since the places that were speaking Arabic was fore and foremost Syria and Lebanon, the beginnings of the Arab printing were in Syria and Lebanon. Technically, uh, the first printing was in Paris. That means journalists and intellectuals from Syria, some of them from Egypt, came to Paris, printed their papers, and send them back to the Middle East. It of course, it would take a month or so until people get uh, uh, the papers. Now, who were writing in those papers? Usually intellectuals um, and uh, writers and poets and people who knew to read and write. Now, if you take an historical view on the Middle East in the mid-19th century, most of the people, sometime in places like uh, Egypt, Morocco, uh, the illiteracy was coming between 80 to 90 percent. Namely, you're trying to print a paper, but who is going to read it if 80 to 90 percent are illiterate? So it was clear that intellectuals writing in those papers and that for intellectual, for very few people can read and write. And all this building of identity came through culture. The beginning of uh, journalism came together with the beginning of uh, theater in the Arab world, beginning of new theater, modern theater, um, um, movies, and, and of course, nationalities. So it started from very good writers with a very high Arabic, as we call it in Arabic, Fusha Arabic, which means what is the uh, Arabic of the literature, Arabic, high Arabic. And it was clear that, uh, as I mentioned in my last lecture, that a Syrian and a Moroccan, if they would like to speak with each other, they cannot understand each other because the differences on the dialect are so big that they cannot do it. I myself, when I served in Egypt as a diplomat, and my driver would like to speak with my family, that my wife's family came from Morocco, uh, my driver didn't know French, and the Arabic of my family was Moroccan Arabic, so I have to translate between them. You know the guy who was born in Israel, that his parents came from Europe, I have to translate the Arabic for them because they couldn't understand each other. The dialects are very different. That's important to understand. So, actually, very highly qualified writers and philosophers 
and authors uh, wrote in the newspapers. Not only wrote, but sometimes edited it and put a very important place for literature, for culture within the papers. But very few people read it among the Arab people. So there was a gap between those who were shapers of the Arab culture and identity and journalism and most of the people because the people couldn't read and couldn't understand what those elite is talking about. That basically went on due in the first, through the first half of the 20th century. And then, as I said before, it started in the intellectual places, especially in Beirut, the, the, the Frances College in Beirut that later on became the American University of Beirut. And from then on, geographically, to Iraq, to uh, uh, Egypt, and, and so on. In the 30s, due to the British and French mandates in the Middle East, the central culture moved from Beirut to, to Egypt. We have a belly dancer here, and she knows even the cultural issues, even music and theater and singing moved in the mid-30s to Egypt, and of course, the journalism. The first journal that was published in Egypt in the end of the 20s, called Rusal Yusuf, it was a, a weekly, and uh, it was published there. And later on, the dailies came out, the fam most famous is Al-Haram, and later on Al-Akhbar, Jumhuriya, that came later on. And again, the same phenomenon. I tell you even something more interesting. Even in Israel, before establishing the state, in 45, the Arabs have one newspaper, was published in Haifa. Where are Haifa people? You are all here. Uh, uh, Haifa, if somebody knows uh, uh, the area, somebody told me he has an uh, office in Hagefen Street. He's here. Yes. Near, if you're going from Hagefen Street to the right, you have a junction with a light there. Down there is the, uh, it's the center of the paper called Al-Itihad. It's a daily that going, uh, published in, uh, in Israel from 45. Arab daily. Used to belong for many, many years to the Arab Communist Party in Israel and represent it. I refer to it later regarding to nationality and to culture. So uh, the people who actually run this paper were writers, politicians, one of the f most famous editors of this paper called Emil Habibi, and he won Israel Prize for his writing as a, as a, as a writer, not as a journalist. And uh, also many Arab uh, prizes too in the Arab world. And he was devoted to journalism, as same as with Egypt, as same as Iraq, uh, especially before the time of uh, Nouri Said and later on. And, uh, elsewhere in the Arab world. The big change, so we stayed during the half of the century with intellectuals who were actually shaping the agenda of the Arabs and reading and writing, but a very small faction of people. From the 50s, the, a big invention penetrated into the Middle East called radio, and especially transistor radio. Some of us, if you see my white hair, can remember before the YouTube and the Internet and the Facebook that a great deal was to have a radio live can move it from place to place working on batteries. Can you imagine? Such a big deal. Now, why it's so important? Because once you can broadcast live to your own people, you can get to everybody, not to only a small elite of people, and they can listen to you and react. Now, the very famous leader who used this medium very cleverly, whose name was Gamal Abdel Nasser, he was the leader of Egypt after the revolution of 52, till 1970 when he was dead with broken heart after the tragedy he faced in the Six Day War. He was the one who was with great uh, ability 
to use the medium. He was a, he was charismatic. He had leadership. He was a leader of all Arabs. I don't know if you remember my lecture from two days ago. I mentioned the, the uh, differences between Arab nationalism, which I call pan-Arabism, Kaumiya in Arabic, and nation-state Arabism, which means Wataniya. I'm a Syrian, I'm a Lebanese, I'm Egyptian, I'm Arab, but I belong to. So what Abdel Nasser did, using the transistor, that was cheap relatively, so any peasant in the field can come to a coffee house in Cairo or in Alexandria or in Sana'a or in Amman or in Damascus, listen to his voice in a real time. When he speaking with his great ability of oratory about with enthusiasm in Arabic and causing the, the, the public to support him and to praise him. Now, this uh, demanded from Abdel Nasser to adopt some kind of a new usage of Arabic. Instead of using very high Arabic, we call Fusha, or what we call dialect in Arabic called Amir, he put a certain way of Arabic that everybody would understand, from Morocco to Syria, from Yemen. So he put it some kind of uh, news media for the, for the people with a lower language that everybody can understand, which called in Arabic Wusta. Wusta is a middle, middle Arabic that everybody can understand, intellectuals and the usual people too. So in fact, he bypassed the difficulty of language to become uh, uh, exposed to all of the people, all of the Arabs. That was a great revolution in bringing messages to the people and recruiting people politically uh, uh, to his own uh, political agenda. Now, he used more tools. For example, I come back to you, I'm sorry, because if you come to Cairo near Tahrir Square and you see all this theater around, Abdel Wahab and, and all those, he, used, he took young, at the time, a young singer named Uncle Tum and brought her to give concerts in the middle of Cairo, using her to promote his political agenda by being a national singer. So every last uh, uh, Thursday of the month, there was a concert in Cairo. Abdel Nasser was talking, Uncle Tum was singing. I don't know how many of you knowing the, the singing of Uncle Tum, but it might take hours. It's a long, long story. Uh, it's a real concert. And they strengthened each other because she gave him the legitimacy as a ruler for the Arabs, not only for Egyptian. And he gave her the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the opportunity to be well known by all Arabs and make him very, the most popular singer, singer in the Arab world up till now, by the way. If you, I'm sure you have cassettes in, in Oslo too on, on her singer, on her uh, uh, songs. So that was a big change in the, in the 50s. So he used wonderfully the radio and brought the Arabs to work together politically through this media uh, uh, tool. In the, the TV penetrated to the Middle East relatively uh, late with a different segregation. In Jordan, for example, I remember as a, as a child uh, in the Six-Day War when uh, Jordanian TV broadcasted to us. And we were astonished and amazed because we didn't have TVs in Israel at the time. We didn't have TV at all. So we have, if one neighbor of mine, if my neighborhood has a TV, all the neighborhood came to see Jordanian TV in his TV. So there was the first one. And later on, it came all over to Egypt and two decades after to the Sudan and to Lebanon and so on and so forth. So the TV came in. And here, Abdel Nasser that lost in 67 couldn't use his great skills to use a TV as he used with the radio. So 
After the, the big disaster of the Arabs in the Six-Day War, uh, the heat moved from Cairo, economically, journalistically, and so on, to the Gulf. Let me say one word about Egypt because it's important. Egypt was the only Arab country at the time, between the 30s and the 40s, under the British rule, that there was kind of um, pluralism in terms of political parties, the Waft Party and some other parties, and journalism. So they had an opportunity to have al Haram, which was established, and sometime uh, some different opinion, not uh, totally against the establishment, but enabled some different approach and not necessarily dictated brutally like we see in Syria or in Iraq, uh, they have, they enabled some other opinion. That was the British uh, encouraged this pluralism in Egypt at the time. And in fact, by, by the papers, Egypt was, I think, the last one to preserve some of it after the times of Abdel Nasser, namely Sadat and Mubarak. So when the TV went, and I, as I said, the cultural center, the journalist center was in Egypt. It was in Egypt as a stronger leader, leading country in the Arab world, was very proud to lead the uh, culture, media life of the Arab world. But that has changed since the Arab money moved to the Gulf after in the 70s, and then the, uh, the uh, Saudi elite, by the way, you, you uh, deserve a mazel tov, a mabruk, because the Saudi ambassador arrived to Oslo now, so I'm serious. So he will start to function uh, here next week, I think. Uh, the Saudis uh, decided to, co they understood during the beginning of the 70s that media is power and they wanted to control the power at, at least at the Arab agenda and not to enable the Egyptians to lead anymore. And uh, so they tried to buy new papers due to the money of the petrodollars, buy new journalists, for example, to take like we, we see today with the football teams in Europe. We, they buy, they give huge amount of money for stars in, in the football. They used to do it with the journalists. So what they did, they took the best journalists in the Arab world from Lebanon, from Egypt, some Palestinians, and so on, brought them to the Gulf, especially to Jeddah, created sometimes new papers. Probably you heard the name uh, uh, Aray al -Am in Kuwait, that uh, a very good journal, and Ashar al Ausat, you probably heard, that is the most uh, uh, popular daily in the Arab world. It, today it's published in London. And they brought the best editors and best writers at, to Saudi Arabia, gave them a lot of money, and said, here's your job to develop our media. We want to be serious in that field. So they built, they uh, created some new newspaper, they, they improved some old newspaper. For example, they decided to have some economical journal like Financial Times. They built a paper called Okaz. Okaz is a, the traditional market of Mecca, and that became political, economical paper, very good in chromo paper that uh, enabled later on in the mid 70s to be to to enable the Gulf uh, princes to use the first time in the world a uh, fax edition for the papers. That means that they could operate from Jeddah and immediately in the same day every decision maker in the Arab world, whether he's in Cairo or in Amman or in uh, Damascus, could get the paper at the same day. That was a great achievement and didn't have to rely on his own papers. A, a word about their own papers, okay? And that was a second revolution, I explain why. Uh, when Sarah mentioned uh, Syrian control on the, on the public opinion, on the people, she mentioned also the media 
as a tool for the, for the president or for the regime to use his power sometimes against the people. The, that was actually pamphlet of the president every day what you have to think, what you have to get, what kind of news you, you should supposed to, uh, to get, what kind of, of news you should never know about it. And you simply gave the editor of the paper what to say on a daily briefing by your uh, uh, minister of information or whatever. And that was a message that was very clear. That belonged to what we call local Arabism. Syria has Tishreen, has al -Bas. Egypt has Al-Ahrar, and al jumhuriya and Al-Haram, and so on. Jordan have Arai, or Ad-Dustur. Every country, every ruler could tell his messages through his, his, uh, his papers. That was, it's very clear, even now. When the Saudis and the Gulf in Kuwait started to operate through a fax uh, uh, editions, uh, all of a sudden, they could bypass other rulers by in newspapers above, sometimes, above the heads of other rulers. That's very meaningful. Especially when we take into consideration that in the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, it was easier to function to those newspapers from Europe and not from the Middle East. The, Real estate at the time in London and Paris was cheap, so they bought houses in basically in London, but also in Paris and Rome, and they moved those papers, editorials, to the, to Europe. So actually, from 80s, those papers who call today the international Arab media were oper operating from Europe, back to the Middle East like it was in the beginning when I said that the first publication in the mid-19th uh, century was in, from Paris. So we repeat the same path, and uh, the money and the messages came from Europe. And that was the second revolution, and everybody tend to believe that now, when editors and journalists are free, living in a democracy, now, all of a sudden, the democracy will go back and penetrate to the Arab world. That was the main thinking through the media. And especially when in the end of the 80s, they, uh, and money, there's no problem in the Gulf, not uh, in Saudi Arabia. They put a lot of money uh, in the papers. And they also started to use the TV or satellite TV for the tool. Again, they started to operate from Europe. Uh, uh, um, NBC, I remember when he started uh, 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 from Paris, uh, uh, in, in uh, orbit from Rome, as uh, they started to operate not only as a satellite TV, but also as an interactive TV. And all of a sudden, messages came back to the Middle East from Italy, from London, from Paris. So everybody who actually following carefully about the Arab media was sure that now is a spring, the Arab Spring is coming. I'm talking about the, the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, okay? Now, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, I myself uh, was back for my, one of my uh, services in, in the US and uh, my boss came to the director general at the time and said, look, this guy is knowing Arabic, he has a background in Islam, in Arab, in the Middle East, but also he has a uh, background in the media. So why don't you try to cope together and send him to create a new division in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which will be the Ministry as a division of Arab media. So in 95, I started to walk in Jerusalem. At that time, our ministry was near Jaffa Street, as you remember, and the all media, CNN and all this, and we have, as you know, the second largest number of media uh, in the world. They're sitting just across the street. I simply took my legs and going there to meet all these. And I, to my extreme surprise, I discovered that we have just in front of the ministry, Saudi TV, Bahraini TV, Qatari TV, not Al Jazeera, uh, 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 and 
which I never imagined that they're sitting in Jerusalem. And I said, what a great opportunity to recruit them and starting to work with them because for the first time I can, I can have the opportunity to speak in Arabic directly to the Arabs through their own channels. That was wonderful. Instead of uh, having our own channels in Hebrew and then uh, broadcasting to the Arab world and said, oh, those Zionists who know them, they want to give them messages. Why don't you use, the, when, when I have the media here, so I opened this uh, uh, division and all of a sudden they were in our list and they got all the messages like foreign, like uh, foreign, and I brought them to the ministry to interview the Minister of Foreign Affairs and later on the Prime Minister and so on and it became very important and very crucial to us because in 96, Al Jazeera was established in Doha, in Qatar, not in London, not in, uh, and I say a word about it too. Uh, so, actually, in less, in less than 100 years, we're facing an ongoing revolution in the Arab media that actually affecting tremendously on the Arab public, on the Arab mind, on the Arab exposure to media from illiteracy of most of the people to be involved in the news in a way that they never knew before and enabling them to be participant on the political system. For Arab leaders, that was extremely crucial for their political agenda. And they, I, I'll, I'll give some words about it. So, and then uh, when Al Jazeera came into the game, and I happened to be in Qatar in 97 in uh, one of the conferences there, and I was invited to see the studio of Al Jazeera, and I brought some uh, two or three Israeli uh, uh, TV people with me, they were astonished for the uh, editing, uh, the digital editing at the time in Al Jazeera was the best, I'm talking about 97, was the best in the world. Money, no problem in Qatar, you know. There are, uh, they can, uh, uh, if you would know Hebrew, I have a good joke about it, but I cannot translate it to Norwegian. Uh, but uh, the way they're handling uh, uh, the, the, the media is part of a Qatari uh, policy. Now, I'm going back to my lecture a few days ago. When the fighting about who is an Arab, about identity, is still going on very highly, the big Arab countries and poor, like Egypt, fighting on their resources with the newcomers to the, uh, to the Arab market, namely Qatar or Bahrain or uh, Dubai. And all of a sudden, in the case of Qatar, when you have 200,000 people, that's all in Qatar, and, and all the rest are foreign workers, okay? With the foreign workers, there are less than a million, 800,000, that's all. In Qatar, when they are among the f 10 leading countries in, expo in uh, producing oil and gas, you can um, imagine how much money they have. Now, they won't donate it to the Palestinians, don't worry about it. They, uh, they will take care about their own politics. So what, what they will do, they decided to open a channel that will be pretty modern or even in the, in the, in the first line of the modern and modernized TVs will serve the Qatari Emirate, the Emir of Qatar, which finances it by 100%, okay? He brought Al Jazeera knowing that the Arab collective identity is declining and this nation state depends on their ability going up and he wanted to show to Egypt, for example, that you, with your 88 million people, are nothing compared to us because you are poor, you don't have power anymore. And we, the small country, with the big resources, we make fun of you because we show you who is the new Arab is. And we are the new Arab. We have the ability. So they used Al Jazeera in order to provoke any Arab leader, you name it. Arafat, Gaddafi, Mubarak, Assad, everybody. And immediately afterwards, the leader came 
with complaints to the Emir of Qatar, not to Al Jazeera. What the hell your media is doing to me? Your media, they know the game. And he like it very much. And I remember the story in 97 when uh, the uh, representative of Al, Al Jazeera in Israel uh, was interviewing Arafat at the time with two shoes were above his head, which is a big insult in Arab codes. And Arafat said, I'm not working with all schmucks anymore. Now, Hanan Ashrawi ran to Arafat and said, what the hell are you doing? You're cutting your own tree. If you don't have Al Jazeera, how can people know about you? So she worked very hard to make a compromise between them. But they, they, he was very angry. And same Mubarak. They, banned the convention in 97 and so on and so forth. So Al Jazeera became, it's not a media faction. It's a political faction. And he used it very smartly and still uses it. And uh, the second thing was the relationship with Israel. Not the Qataris extremely fall in love with us. That's not uh, the case. They want to show to other Arabs that we as a small one making whatever we want, including with our worst enemy with Israel, and we'll do it. And they did it just in order to provoke others. They didn't really do anything serious about the bilateral relations, but uh, they make a lot of noise. And that, in order, any other arm said, you see, those are different, those are different. Now, Al Jazeera, from the beginning, ne criticized everything that moved in, in the Arab society. The taboos on a women's status, the uh, some debates about the Quran and so on. Only one thing they never mentioned, Qatar, the policy of Qatar. It was clear. Qatar, you know, uh, um, same story in Syria. The, st the women's status, the, uh, the way they're handling their tradition, but no, no word about Qatar, only about others. Uh, so uh, that became, in a way, because of the provocation, a yellow journalism. It's true that they open uh, some kind of debate, like uh, the famous, uh, one of the famous leading programs called in Arabic, al al Muakkas, which you put two people, one from the establishment and one from the opposition, and they're fighting with each other. That was nice. But somebody later on asks himself, hey, what about the others? I mean, on the ball, of the opinions, we only hear two opinions. What about the others? It's not represent uh, the two. And in 2003, when I happened to be in academic convention in London, listening to uh, uh, to those leading journalists in, in their convention, uh, uh, the Arab, at the time, Al Arabiya was established after the war in just close to the war in Iraq in 2003, and they was criticized in an inner circle of Arab journalism. They criticized heavily and sharply Al Jazeera. I said, you're not independent. You cannot produce anything. You get instructions for your boss whom to bring to interviews and whom not, and so on and so forth. And he didn't deny it. OK? So it became, in the early 2000s, a symbol of populistic journalism, not serious, not without ethics, not following the truth and the facts. And uh, in fact, after 2003, some Arab PhD students made a research about Al Jazeera, and he said that Al Jazeera actually representing Al Qaeda. What I'm, I'm trying to say is that from being identified as open, free media, it became uh, coming closer and closer to the most uh, radicals uh, in, the, in the Islam and in the Arab world. And uh, they tried to use their power to promote their agenda. I'll give you an example. Intifada al-Aqsa started in the year 2000. Any media who were there in Jerusalem or elsewhere in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, waited to see what will be in the uh, development in, the, uh, in this intifada. Al Jazeera sent his uh, camera there, took the pictures of the people, put a song 
called Fen al Malayin in Arabic, where are the millions? They are, showed the killing people and said, and built a song there, where are the millions to support us? Where are you? And broadcasted in a live against any censorship what's going on, trying to bring to enthusiasm all the people, all the Arab people. Now that create two, two things. First, uh, uh, there was against any journalistic ethic. Second, the Arab leaders were frightened to death because Mubarak and Assad thought that now when we have TV satellite everywhere, every corner, every coffee house, everybody will see what's going on in Israel, and tomorrow they have a demonstration in Egypt and in Syria. And they were extremely angry at Al Jazeera and the, on, on Qatar for doing that kind of thing. That you didn't hear here, but I know I follow it for many years, so I, uh, I see it. Now, then the Emir of Qatar probably understood the power that he has because of Al Jazeera, so instead of using the message that I brought before to bring some democracy, Western values to the Arab world, they decided, Al Jazeera, to bring Arab messages to the Western world. And therefore they decided, a few years before they started, to have a channel of Al Jazeera in English. And that's what they're doing. So actually, Al Jazeera, with a soft-spoken and nice English channel, bringing the Arab messages, some of them very extreme, against the West. I don't know if you pay attention to that, but they're supposed to be very moderate, very advanced. That's not the case. So at that point, I understood that the story about Arab media as a trigger for changes in the Middle East is a little bit premature. Now, what they actually succeeded in doing is to provoke the Arabs to understand that the, there is a world outside of the Middle East. That's true because in the satellite with the technology and so on, they could see it. So the, the unrest or the Arab Spring, if you like, that you see now, it's a process of more than a decade or so of enabling people before the Facebook, before the even before the uh, uh, blogs and everything that enable the Arabs to know that there's a world around the Middle East and there's a possibility to bring their protest outside. That was very uh, uh, important. Now, when it came to a situation that they would like to present bravely some alternative, they said very clearly, the media, the rulers of the Arab world, and the public in the Arab world, we can get, not get, break the taboos that we have. That we have a cultural code, definitely not, not of the West. We cannot go uh, bluntly against our rulers, and the public said, don't break the rules. So it became, basically after 2003, a line which was a, a cooperation between the journalists, the publics, and the rulers, not to break the rules. That what I think that you can find it in a way in Norway, in a, in a, in a way, at least between the journalists and the government and the academia. So, but uh, 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 they refused constantly, refused. I remember Mubarak and Assad, when they spoke with Bush, they say, don't dare to dictate to us our democracy, our behavior, our values. We are different. We are accepting many of your agendas, but not your values. You have to understand we have a different culture. I think with we in the West, including ourselves, not always understand that point. That's a crucial point to understand. And unlike the Americans, we think that not to ask to involve and to educate others, not uh, Egyptians, not Syrians, uh, uh, and not to preach them how to behave. I, I think we have to respect their own culture, whether we like it or not. Uh, it's not uh, uh, depend on us. So 
that created a situation that they broke some rules of, if you like, globalization, open uh, channels, but they didn't bring the alternative. So, okay, we open the system, we enable the people to understand that there's a world beyond the Middle East, but how we can contain the new, uh, the new situation? Do we create some other structure in the Middle East? Do we uh, change something in our behavior? Would we uh, use the opportunity to promote ourselves economically? Those questions are still open because uh, if you check carefully now what's going on in Egypt, really, that was very enthusiastic to support the people who are got tired from the rulers, but what we have there, the army, the military, still leading Egypt to the point that they could have their process for more openness. So who is the army? Same army that Mubarak came from. Uh, who is Amr Musa, who is supposed to be the nominate to be a president? A guy from the very narrow aristocracy in Egypt that used to be the foreign minister of Mubarak. We're not talking about a real revolution right now. And they not really want to hear about adopting Western values. We, by the way, we don't have to be insulted from them. We have to respect everybody has its own culture. And if they say that democracy is not important in their culture, it's their own view. I, as Israeli, I wish uh, that I have uh, neighbors that were democracies. It would be much easier. Uh, it, it's true. But if they decided not to, what can I say? Can I go and and, and make them uh, be democracies. We can do that. So it's a process. About Syria, you just heard before, uh, uh, whenever somebody, they don't give the information to the people, they controlling the information. If somebody dare to demonstrate, they shooting them, including with tanks. Libya, same story. Yemen, it's uh, a different story. It uh, belong to a very, radical and very fragile um, structure of Yemen for many years. I don't know if you remember there was a time that was southern Yemen and northern Yemen and, uh, uh, and so on. Bahrain, it's a totally different story. It's a matter of Shiite and Sunnis where Iran heavily involved in moving it. Lebanon was always a joke. There was no Lebanon is not a state. It's just a uh, collection of sections and uh, nobody really ruled there. Uh, that was used to be under Syria, Syrian control, but uh, uh, we'll see what will happen now. Uh, Lebanon were relatively, um, relative because of this, uh, I would say, uh, pluralism, this, this, uh, derived from the sexual system, secretarian system, the Sunnis and Shiites and, and Druze and so on, each one develop its own TV and own channel, Christians, they have their own papers and so on. So, and some of the, of the uh, satellite TVs in Lebanon are the most, uh, I would say, uh, really uh, uh, open in the Middle East. They were, uh, uh, there was a, one of the, of the mo most uh, yellow and uh, populistic TVs in Lebanon called LBC, Lebanese Broadcasting Center, which is Christian, basically. But the way the women dress there, it's, uh, uh, it's almost pornographic. So what the Arabs cynically saying, call it LBC. In Arabic, LBC is get dressed. So that's a name they're giving to this, uh, which shows you about the uh, necessity of, uh, uh, of understanding the code, the cultural codes uh, of the Arabs. So as you can see, the connection between the politics and the media and the culture is extremely important because if you take away all this uh, 
uh, all this background and think only about, okay, now they have open free uh, media, they will have open free society and democracy, it's not working that way. On democracy, you have to work for many, many generations. It's a state of mind. It's an educational system. It's not doing it one way. One last word about our media in Israel. The Arab media, I mean. Our media, you don't, need, you don't need me for talking about it. It's open. The Arab media started with this Al-Itihad Al uh, paper. The editor at the time, I mentioned his name, Emil Habibi, was many, many years a member of, he was a dean among the Knesset members. He lived in Haifa, his very famous book, Bakiyaf al Haifa. He was my neighbor, very close to your home in uh, Abbas Street, above the Geffen. And he, for many, many years, was a representative of the Communist Party in Israel, which used to be considered many years as the political home of the Arabs of Israel. Uh, and he decided in 48 to establish a special cultural uh, column in a paper called Al Jadid, Al Jadid in Arabic, the, the New, and bring young writers, Arab writers. As you know, Arab language is also a formal language in Israel, together with the Hebrew, to enable young writers, poets, journalists, to take part on the paper in order not to lose the connection to the Arab culture, to the Arab language. Okay? He brought some young and uh, promising people. Some of the names you might have heard. One of them is Mahmoud Dawish. You probably heard the name. He became later on the national poet of the Palestinians. He grew up in the Galilee. He lived in Haifa up till 1970. No, new fluent Hebrew, he wrote in Hebrew, and then he moved to the PLO, he ran away from, from Israel in the 70s, and became the national poet of the Palestinians. The other one is uh, also a very important poet in the Arab world, called Samich El Qasem, still live in Galilee, I know him personally, and uh, he's also considered one of the leading poets in the Arab world. Now, it's important to point out this point, because those people not only preserved the Arabic, the culture, but by the, of course, Emil Habibi himself, they brought the level of the Arabic in Israel to be appreciated as very high in the Arab world. Now, most of the claims against Zionism and against Jews that we're depressing the Arab, we don't enable them to have their rights, so if that is the case, how come the Arabs are glorifying the high level of the Arabic in Israel? And I happen to learn in the Arabic, uh, uh, the Arabic language, one of my majors in, in my studies was in, in the uni in university in Israel. I, I studied with Arab, and I know what about the level of the language. So until Six Day War, everybody condemned the Arab as collaborators with the Zionists. After 67, all of a sudden, when uh, the borders were open, people tend to appreciate the high level of Arabic that we have in Israel. So that due to the idea that the Arabs should preserve the heritage and the language. So uh, it's interesting that even in Israel, like in Lebanon, like in Egypt, like in the Gulf, the function, the role of the media as building for political agenda and preserving nationalist tendencies is still there. It's very important, very high. So uh, you, can, you can go in the Zionist city of Haifa and, and see one of the most important houses for Arabic language in the world. I mean, uh, that's amazing. It's very interesting. Now we, uh, your next trip, you pay attention when you go, we put uh, in that street, a little behind, songs on the wall of Jews and Arab writers. You, it's called the, the, the Way of the Songs. You simply walk from Hagefen Street and see the song with the name of the writers, Jews and Arabs, in the song, all the way up to this journal, Al-Itihad, 
which located there. It's very interesting to see the culture because we think that as much as we respect somebody else's culture, it might contribute to your culture yourself. I think it's uh, important. So there's no any interest to suppress somebody else, but to learn from somebody else. That's my personal opinion. So if you want me to give you kind of a, a prophecy about what will go out of those media, political, social spring, the Arab Spring, I don't know. I, we need the time to digest the process where it will be led to, uh, but I can assume very carefully that it will take some time. So that was long enough and pretty boring, so if you have some question, please do it now because I don't want to take off your time when you go home and finish the convention. <laughs>